This argument by Jerome is really powerful. What would a position be that believed this argument specifically? That submission to the one head of the church is a necessary sign of proper Christian practice, but didn't intend to say anything about fallibility of the papacy. And so instead, what you have would mirror the organic family. A father in a traditional family may tell his children he is always right, certainly demand unequivocal obedience. However, the help from God is to the obedient son and the faithful father. Christ is with the good son in obedience. Christ is with a good father in selfless and faithful leadership. If a son is loyal to an imperfect father, like in the case of Noah and Shem, the son is blessed in his faithfulness and is even blessed in holding his father's feet to the fire. Holding leadership's feet to the fire is Christ-like. Interestingly, Christ never condemned following the Pharisaic and temple authority, but instead required his servants to be obedient, but at times annoyingly, to also be obedient to the higher divine authority exemplified in the Torah and prophets. Simply following the Pharisees was not enough. So, what I want to ask is this. What if what Christ meant in Matthew 16, 18 was exactly what he said? You are rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Christ established a special fatherly authority in Peter, but the authority was like the authority of the father of a family. Peter and his successors will be blessed in leading and those who follow him will be blessed by following. Being obedient to Peter, realizing he may be strengthened or not strengthened, is blessed. It is blessed in the very practice of it, and being obedient to the Petrine chair undergirds the oneness of Catholicity and is blessed as well. So like the sons and daughters of a large family, we are called to an organic obedience of the mystical father in the representation of the Pope, and that Pope is called to an organic fatherhood, blessed in the function of the office, and in this faithfulness, he is blessed with indefectibility. But can he lead his children into error? Just like the organic family, yes he can. Sons are blessed in obedience, but also must be wise as serpents. So indefectibility is defined as, one, the church was established by Christ and is continuously guided by the Holy Spirit. Two, the church will endure until the end of time as a visible and organized community. Three, the church will always uphold and teach the true faith as revealed by Christ. Peter and his office will always be guided by the Holy Spirit. Christ will, as he said, be with this church under Peter till the end of time. The coordination between the church and the papacy will always teach the faith needed for salvation. But this will be a messy process, just like all family. So, this is just questions I am trying to understand. I think all diligent and serious Catholics are facing the same questions today. I can see the hand of God guiding the church in unity. The unity of the church stands apart in history, one body under one head. What other institution has shown this character? Judaism after the fall of the temple has not. Islam attempted to preserve the prophethood of their founder in the earliest years, but this failed. The so-called Orthodox have not been able to coordinate to address emerging issues in the culture after their ruptures with Rome. On the global and universal scale, only the church claims this single and unified authority and it stands out as a marvel in history, like a beacon on a hill. Whether they like it or not, every Christian around the world has looked to Rome for guidance, and in a sense, the entirety of the Christian and non-Christian world has done the same. But one thing that is apparent is that it's not as neat and tidy as the faithful Catholic would like it to be. Like the parallel of the young child growing in the house of his father when he realizes that his father can make mistakes. I remember the heartrending moment when my eldest son heard me talking among adults and I said, I had too much to drink. 
He pulled me aside and asked, Getting drunk is a sin, isn't it? You don't sin, right? I remember that look on his face, shattered, heartbroken, and I felt the same thing. Christ said, Peter, When you are strengthened, strengthen your brethren. It's dangerous to keep inappropriate expectations of authority from parents. In that same manner, it's dangerous to keep inappropriate expectations of church leadership. The sign of divine guidance is written all over the unity of the church. It's something we should cling to and not lose. But as Christ, we use a parable. And the model we should look at is the family. One of the traits often described with narcissism is snapshotting. Snapshotting is when someone takes an oversimplified image of someone that they have constructed for themselves and interacts with that image instead of the person they are actually talking to. The narcissist will file these snapshots into two opposing folders, with me and against me. If someone is in the with me folder of a narcissist's collection of synthetic relationships and the real person deviates from the image the narcissist has constructed for them, they will be corralled. When that person doesn't deviate just a little, but deviates too far from the snapshot that has been constructed for them, this can cause a narcissistic injury to the narcissist, and they will be defamed and discarded and filed into the against me folder. If you meet someone and you start to notice progressively that they start attributing qualities to you, usually good qualities that they've only come to through inference, that really do not apply to you. Consider this a danger sign. If you're raised to sainthood by them, expect to fall to hell. This is a sign of an unstable friendship. A measured and consistent person will recognize in humility that like themselves, those they interact with are flawed as well. A narcissist requires quality from others that in the end you will not be able to meet and will be cast down or subjugated. This devaluing relationship style betrays a worrying trait that is united to all forms of psychological disorder, and this is acting with an externalized locus of control. Problems come from without. The unhealthy mind sets itself up as judge of all the evil coming against it from out there. When we have this unhealthy mindset, we are always dealing with inadequacies from those around us. Everyone else is not good enough. I think we may set ourselves up in a position like this when we require perfection from the papacy. If we require perfection from our earthly fathers and they fail us, some of us will reject them. These troubled youth are in all of our families. They are us in our youth when we run away, lash out and devalue our parents for having betrayed us by deviating from the perfection we always expected. The same profile of this wayward youth ready to turn on his parents at the slightest sign of deviation from their image of perfection has its tells in people who rely heavily on the perfection of the Pope. It's especially apparent in those who think even the sentiments of the Pope require assent. So my argument, my question is not a question of truth versus falsehood, but a question of proper disposition of the congregant. I see warning signs in congregants who expect and require too much from the chair of Peter. And I think requiring or even thinking much less about the Pope may be proper. So is this an orthodox opinion? Is this an allowed opinion? Is this a healthy and spiritually safe opinion? Please let me know because I'm just trying to feel my way through this.